The Campbell family was harassed in Boston. Neighbors did not like the fact that a white woman, Lillian, married an African-American man, Jeffrey Campbell Sr. Their son, Jeffrey Jr., recalled that neighbors tried to split their water mains, hoping to force them to leave. And it worked. In 1919, the young family, which included nine-year-old Jeffrey and three-year-old Marguerite, moved to Nashua, New Hampshire. By 1920, they attended the Universalist Church there. Campbell recalled, when I was nine years old, my mother told me that I could go to any Sunday school of my choice. And I tried the Methodists and the Baptists, and the refreshments weren't there. The Congregationalists provided seconds, and the Universalists put them down and let me help myself. The all white congregation there struggled to include the Campbell children, sometimes failing, but often triumphant. The intention of universalism was not always exactly its practice. The self-satisfied middle class was only hesitantly accepting, and Jeffrey asked himself, should I take a role in this? Jeffrey Sr. died when, he, when Jeff Jr. was just 12. Eventually, the younger Jeffrey got more and more involved in the church and felt a calling to ministry. And he moved here to Canton to attend St. Lawrence University with the intention of becoming a minister. See a picture of him on your right and a picture of his sister Marguerite. And there's a picture of him um, preaching. Thanks. He would have been the only person on, of color on campus. In 1933, he received his undergraduate degree in English at St. Lawrence University. And Universalist leaders opposed his entrance into the theological school solely on race. But the dean, John Murray Atwood, made them back down. Jeff was a great student. And he was a student minister in a tiny Winthrop, New York, about 25 miles northeast of Canton. The small congregation reported to Jeff's professors that he was the best preacher, best pastor, and best community worker they ever had had. Jeff recalled his six years at St. Lawrence as the richest he had known. The prospect of his ordination prompted the Reverend Harry Westbrook Reed of Watertown, New York, just an hour down the road from us, to write to the Reverend Roger Etz, Secretary and General Superintendent of the Universalist Convention, saying, no parish of any size will accept him. Reverend Etz wrote at the time in a very blind sort of way, personally, I have no color prejudice, and Theoretically, there should be not be in any of our churches, but practically speaking, there is bound to be, and I do not anticipate any success in settling him as a minister. My own feeling is that this problem ought to have been faced squarely by the theological school long ago, and that it was a mistake to let him feel he could finish his course and then secure a church. For his ordination interview, Jeff said they took about 30 minutes of questions on his theology and about four hours on his politics. Jeff was an outspoken socialist. Despite universalism's prejudices, Jeff graduated from the Canton Theological School and was ordained into ministry in 1935. By my count, he was the fourth person of color to be ordained as a universalist minister. And not unlike today, the most segregated hours of the week are on Sunday morning. Universalism went against their own formal teaching, which emphasized the siblinghood of humanity. 
Though nothing was said publicly or to Jeff's face, white leadership was not going to let him serve a congregation. You can call this institutional racism, system, systemic racism, or simply racism. One can have the highest ideals and still not escape the evil clutches of white supremacy. Jeff tried his luck with the Unitarians. They gave him fellowship in 1938. At that time, there would have been only one other Unitarian minister of color. Jeff wanted to serve our faith, but officials who could connect him to congregations would literally walk the other way when he came into the room. The president of the American Unitarian Association the Reverend Elliot said to the 28 year old grown man, my dear boy, be patient. Jeff was very active and became a leader in many ways. In 1938, Jeff actually ran for governor of Massachusetts as a socialist coming in fourth. Jeffrey's sister also enrolled at St. Lawrence University and graduated in 1939. In that year, she married Canton Theological School student Francis David, who was white. Jeff officiated the wedding. Soon after, the Reverend John Van Schaik denounced the marriage in a widely circulated periodical, The Christian Leader, also known as The Universalist Leader. The newspaper is one of the more important religious ones in the nation. And back then, if you were a universalist, you probably had a subscription to it. Van Shake called mixed marriages not only unwise, but morally wrong, that cursed their offspring, even calling the children of such unions handicapped from birth. He concluded. David, the white minister in training, because of his immoral marriage to Marguerite, a woman he loved since high school, was incapable of becoming a universalist minister and serving a church. Van Shaik even requested that he be dismissed from the theological school. Again, Van Shaik came to this racist and very public conclusion without the slightest feeling that he was not living up to our ideals of human siblinghood, of which universalism at the time was priding itself in. Van Shaik back then was a big deal. Perhaps the most powerful pulpit was the periodical he was editor of, but he was not an evil man. He was an early proponent of the social gospel, which aimed at creating the kingdom of heaven on earth, whose legacy we stand in. Van Shaik had a long and successful ministry of helping the poor in tenement housing. He even took a leave of absence from his ministry to help refugees. In 1910, he got an honorary degree from St. Lawrence University. He even volunteered for the Red Cross in Europe after World War I and inspired the, the Universalist Service Committee. He actually was so important that he has his own Wikipedia page. Can you believe that? You can be racist and be a good person. Van Shaik also referred to Jeff in his writing that it was fine for a black man to get a ministerial education, but that he should go serve his own race or just go elsewhere. Van Shaik, in many ways, represented the majority view of universalism at the time. However, John Murray Atwood defended Marguerite, her husband, and Jeff. John Murray Atwood grew up here in Canton. His father was the dean of the theological school, and he served as Dean of the school himself from 1914 to 1951. Atwood Hall on SLU's campus is named after him and his father. 
Atwood was actually a member of this congregation. He taught RE and served on our church council. Atwood claimed Van Shake's editorials made universalism into a useless profession and called out the editor's racism and discrimination. He boldly proclaimed that Jeff was a great preacher with intelligence and dedication. And the Winthrop Church, if they had the means, would have hired him as their minister. Atwood suspects most readers will be astonished by what he said and that everyone and that will think what a bunch of inexperienced, impractical, unrealistic young radicals they must have up there at St. Lawrence. We must be in the minority, he concluded, but oftentimes the minority is correct. By the time these editorials and responses were being written, Jeff had already moved to Great Britain to study and teach. He responded the following year in 1940 with a, from a wealth Welsh village in a stunning and beautifully argued autobiographical essay entitled Personality, Not Pigmentation. His thinking precludes Dr. King's not be judged by the content, by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character by over two decades. He appeals to the calling of universalism, to the unity of humanity. And he said, churches must create little oases in which persons from the widest possible variety of racial and cultural backgrounds can know each other as persons. I cannot give in, Jeff wrote, and do the comfortable thing which would morally weaken the spiritual stand which the universalist church must make. Jeffrey goes into explaining his own race. Now he does not refer to himself as black or white. He refuses a simple racial categorization. He said he was 11 sixteenths Anglo-Saxon and 5 sixteenths West Afri of West African descent, giving proof that the offspring of mixed marriages is not a curse at all. He believed race shouldn't define people and that universalism's faith should disrupt race racism, not perpetuate it. Jeffrey's brother-in-law, Francis David, never served a congregation and soon changed prof professions. Marguerite, worked for the Universalist Church of America, and after the merger, the Unitarian Universalist Association for over 30 years. She worked closely with some of the same people who were actively trying to ruin her brother's and her husband's career. Our very own uh, the Reverend David Weisbart, member of this church, knew Marguerite from her time working for the UUA. Jeffrey went on living in Europe for a total of 13 years, teaching literature to laborers and returning soldiers. In 1951, he returned to the US to teach English at the Putney School in Vermont, a private boarding school. He retired from there in 1980. In the 1960s, as UUs across the country were backing the civil rights movement, not one single recognition of his situation came from the UUA. I guess it's always easier to critique society, the other institutions. Change is difficult, especially change from within. In 1965, Jeff began a part-time ministry at the UU Church in Amherst, Massachusetts. He got that position on his own without any help from officials at the UUA. Jeff could preach and preach passionately. And despite not using a manuscript or notes, he quoted a wide variety of literature. In fact, he was invited to preach at the service of the living tradition in 1969 General Assembly, which has to be one of the highest honors for a UU minister. 
His ministerial reports and newsletters from that time were filled with social critique. The congregation, though, wanted a full-time minister who could be there during the week, build an institution, and be a fundraiser. Jeffrey said they were committed to preserving the institution, but he was more about keeping alive its radical religious spirit. His radical justice themes in his sermons eventually wore out the welcome of his congregation, and they parted ways in 1974. The UUA never followed up with him. After serving the Amherst congregation, he was an unpaid on-call minister for the church in Brattlesboro, Vermont. In 1979, he wrote to the UUA and spoke of all the people that persuaded him to leave ministry. And in all caps, he ended that letter. I would still undertake the call had I my life to relive. Words that were eventually put on his gravestone. Marguerite died in 1983, Jeffrey one year later. Just recently, a couple of years ago, eight, in fact, 83 years after Jeffrey Campbell's ordination, UU Executive Vice President Kerry McDonald offered up on behalf of the UUA a humble apology to Jeffrey, Marguerite, Lillian, and Francis, and to their family. I can only imagine what would have been illuminated had the brilliant light of these ancestors been permitted to shine. The Nashua, the Nashua Church recently renamed their sanctuary, the Campbell Chapel. A theater has been named in Jeff's honor at the Putney School for his years of teaching there. And as president of the St. Lawrence Foundation for Theological Education, I helped create a scholarship in Jeff's name to encourage people of color to go into ministry. An old house, such as ours is never anywhere near perfect, patched together by different workers and owners throughout time. Old wiring, slanted floors, doors from gutted houses, walls of cracked plaster. We cannot, nor should we, hide the facts of the broken parts of our old house. Jeff wanted to live out the values of our faith and serve our faith, but our own institution prevented it. He boldly attempted to put our faith into practice, but he was told by the highest of powers, be patient, boy. But something broken can be whole again and have a different, fuller, more complex beauty. Jeff took his calling seriously, and so must we. Let's rebuild this house of ours by recentering stories like Jeff's. Let's remember the Reverend Jeffrey Campbell as a missed opportunity. Let's honor him for his commitment to justice and to our radical faith. He faced racism and still answered the call of universalism. So let us keep in his honor dismantling white supremacy and fully realize the call of universalism, that we are related, that there is a unity to humanity that racism can be overcome. May we all undertake this calling. Amen and blessed be.